Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to be here. And we have a special guest for you tonight, today, depending on where you are in the world, uh, Oscar Tromboli. Now, he has written a book. I've got it right here, Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words. Um, I don't want to give it away, but I've certainly got some questions. I mean, everybody that listens to this podcast, I'm sure, has had some type of training or reading on active listening. Oscar takes it to a totally new level. So uh, with that, Oscar, um, where do you want to start tonight? Well, I think for most of us, we see in color, but we listen in black and white. We're kind of two-dimensional when it comes to listening. It's often like we didn't learn how to listen at school. We learn maths, we learn English, but we don't know the fundamentals of listening. We spend half our day speaking, half our day listening, but only 2% of us have ever been trained in how to listen. So I'm on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world because I think deep listening is your ability to listen to what's not said rather than to listen only to what is said. And whether that's in corporates, in governments, in individual relationships, most things that break down come back to not listening. And you know, after 30 years of a career in technology and telecommunications, I was famous for forcing our sales teams, our marketing teams, our operations teams, our finance teams, our legal teams to actually dial into the contact centers for organizations like Microsoft and Vodafone because in big corporations, rarely do they listen to customers. So if you're running a smaller business, you have a huge advantage. Your listening ears are much more attuned to what the customer needs than bigger organizations. So before I leave this planet, Dave, I'd love to create 100 million deep listeners, and today we're going to make a dent in that. Hey, I would love to see that happen. And, and you touched on a nerve a little bit that I don't want to go too far down the rabbit trail. But if you if you think about what would happen in our countries, you're in Australia, we're up here in the, in the States. Um, if we actually taught kids at an early age how to do deep listening and how that would affect their lives long term. And, and I'm only, you know, half, three quarters of the way through your book, but um, it would be incredibly powerful. I mean, we've got another toxic presidential campaign coming up here. They don't listen to each other at all. So it'd be a totally different situation. Yeah, I heard a beautiful speaker once. He spoke from stage and he was, he was talking about the difference he was making after the tsunami in, um, in Asia way back where uh, hundreds of thousands of lives were lost through Indonesia, through Sri Lanka and all of that. And it was this beautiful question that came from the audience, which was, how do you bring about world peace? And everybody was expecting this spectacular answer. And all he said was, go home, look after your family. I think too many of us give up our power to governments. And to be honest, hasn't made a difference to me and my um, career or my business, whatever flavor of government's in, they can get on and do whatever they want. I'm out there to create 100 million deep listeners, whatever government's in place there. So don't give up your power to governments. We can get on and do it. The governments are just an invention in the last 200 years. Humans have been going for thousands of years without government. Let's not give it up. <laughs> so what brought you to creating this um, very systematic approach to deep listening? Oh, well, if I, if I go back into this uh, video conference that was taking place, it was March, it was 2011. It was a video conference between Seattle, Singapore and Sydney, the three S's, the Bermuda Triangle of budgeting at Microsoft at that stage. I was a mic Microsoft marketing director in Australia and our leadership team was negotiating with a regional team, negotiating with the global team for what our budget should be next year. And this was a pretty tense meeting with lots of conflict you can imagine the global team wants to give us a bigger budget than what we think we can achieve in our area and the regional team has to play switzerland and broker in between and the vice president uh said to me at the end of this meeting oscar can you stay behind that's kind of the equivalent of your wife saying we need to talk <laughs> and, uh, it's that moment where you go how much money have i got in terms of months ahead and if I was to lose my job right now, what would that mean? Anyway, Tracy sat me down at the end of the meeting and said, what you did at the 22-minute mark, I've literally made a note in my 
calendar. And she said, you changed the tone of the whole meeting. The way you listened changed the meeting. And we negotiated completely differently, all three sides, because of how you asked the group to think about their listening. And she said to me, Oscar, if you could code that, you could change the world. And in that moment, all I could think of was to say, Tracy, do you mean code code or code? Which is basically, do you want me to write that in software or do you want that as a procedure or methodology or something else? And she said, no, no, code code. I walked away from that meeting, never thinking anything of it until eight weeks later when our chief operating officer, who was also our finance leader, Brian Armstrong said to me, um, we're going to go into the, the same meeting with our field team. We've got to negotiate the budgets with them. Can you do that thing during the meeting again? And I said, what thing, Brian? He says, you know, that, that listening thing you do. I said, oh, Brian, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, we get, we get into the meeting. We're all arm wrestling. About the 40 minute mark, I, I, I pose the same question to the room and Brian pulls me aside afterwards and he goes, I want you to be my listening mentor. I said, Brian, I've got a real job to do. I haven't got time for that and walked away. <laughs> so six months later, our graduate recruitment program was completely broken and I got exactly the same feedback. The way you listen, Oscar, not only do you hear people, but you see what's important to them. Could you run a training course on this? Now, by now, I'm pretty thick. I'm pretty slow. By now, I've put three things together and gone, okay, there's a pattern here. I better pay attention. And that kind of set me on this journey because one of the things I was quite famous for, I didn't ever struggle recruiting staff in my team because every staff member knew they had to go and visit the call center and understand what the customer issues were because that was always my interview question. If they didn't understand the customers well enough, if all they saw was the research, that wasn't good enough for me. You really have to hear what the customers were saying. And for a lot of you listening, you might be surprised, big corporates don't have good ears when it comes to listening to their customers. Smaller businesses, resellers, uh, people who provide additional services are more tuned to what customers need and you have a great advantage there. And um, that set me on the path, Dave, to exploring how could I possibly do this? So for the last five years, um, I've been training the world in how to listen and a good friend of mine once said, so what's your goal for how many listeners? And I said, oh, a million. And Matt said to me, well, add, add a zero. I said, I can't do 10 million. He goes, you can do 10 million. Come back next month. So next month we come back and, and Matt says, how did you go? I said, yeah, with apps and you know media and a whole bunch of um, assessment tools and a book and podcasts. We, we can get to 10 million. He goes, add a zero. And I go, geez, Matt, give me a break. Are we just going to add a zero all the time? <laughs> he said something quite profound, Dave. He said to me, if you can achieve your goal in your lifetime, it's not worth going for. You need to be ambitious enough that your goal can't be achieved in your lifetime so you can impact the generations ahead. Thus, 100 million deep listeners. But last week, someone in Atlanta challenged me to make it a billion. So uh, <laughs> no, uh, no end to this goal. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that um, you basically have your, your markers now. Mm. Where, you know, you've got a uh, 1 million mark, you've got a 10 million mark, and I don't even know how you, how you track it. That's the other mm. question. But I, I would agree with you that 100 million, if you go for it, is a good number. But I would disagree if I understood you correctly. I think you can hit it. I think you can hit it. And once you hit it, then set the billion number. I, I, yeah. like, to, I like to encourage people to set a, you know, a Jim Collins, big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. But yeah. then go hit it. Yeah. Don't say hit it saying, well, I'll never hit it, but I'll try. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my business manager and Nell and I, we sit down every quarter and measure all the media touches, all the people on the newsletters, all the people who've listened to podcasts, all the people who've been in the audiences when I speak. So we've just, we've just gone past 700,000 over five years. So, you know, the big thing for us will be when technology starts to enable some of the things, which is the R&D we're doing in the background at the moment, Dave. Eh? Well, that's great. Now, I'm kind of curious. You, so I've got your, your graphic here. Yeah. 
which so I'll try to hold up here. You're showing the five levels of listening for those of us who are listening right now. There we go. There we go. The five levels of listening. So maybe you can talk them through. And I also found it fascinating because a lot of times when these concentric circles are drawn this way, people are going from the outside in. So you're going from the big down to the core mm. and you went the opposite. You're yeah. like, Hey, you got to start here. And is that because I, I'll ask it, is that because the better you get at this, the more impact you have? So it gets larger. Is that, yeah. I'm, I'm so curious. Deep listening impact beyond words. If you're listening at level five, listening for meaning, the impact is so much more significant, but I've been lucky enough to be influenced by some significant systems thinkers and the systems thinkers often say that Venn diagrams are not good representations of organic systems and organic systems are generational. So they, you, need a, you need a base level, which is level one, which is listening to yourself. Too many of us focus on the speaker and we have a radio station playing in our head and the radio station's broadcasting the signal of the last meeting you're in, the next meeting you're in, the supermarket shopping you need to do on the way home this evening, something you've got to do on the weekend, but you're not present for the conversation. 86% of people are stuck at level one listening because they're distracted by mobile devices, laptops, iPads, the visual distraction that's happening in the room, the coffee shop, the restaurant, that a conversation's taking place, as well as the distraction that's happening in their head. So level one, listening to yourself there's five myths of listening and if you visit listeningmyths.com you can download them but the most common myth around listening is the most important person to focus on is the speaker that's handy but it's not useful it's not productive it's not profound the most important person to listen to is yourself first so if all of us simply switched our phones to flight mode drank a glass of water in every meeting and just took three deep breaths, we would become much more potent listeners. Our listening productivity would jump by nearly 80%. David, when I walk into a client, it's really simple to practice. When I step into the elevator, my phone goes into my bag and it's switched off. Now, some of us are addicted, so flight mode's okay for you. Then in the lift, I just practice three deep breaths and I'm not a yoga instructor. I'm just simply collecting my thoughts and going, what's going to serve the person I'm speaking to next? And then when I go to reception and they typically say, would you like um, a refreshment? I always ask for a glass of water and a glass of water for everybody in the meeting because a hydrated brain is a listening brain. The brain is only 5% of our body mass, yet it consumes 26% of the blood sugar. So if we can get oxygen to the brain, have the brain hydrated and no distractions, you are 80% further ahead than anybody else who's listening in the room. So that's level one. We're going to go a bit faster for the rest, but I might pause there and see if you've got any questions. Well, I think it's really interesting um, because... Um, another aspect, well, if I'm hearing you correctly, basically, you know, you're on the lift elevator and you're, you said kind of clearing your brain, but you're, you're focusing on what's coming up next and what you inferred, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're also clearing everything else out. Yeah. Cause you mentioned all those voices and all those emotions and everything else is going, you're clearing all those out. Yeah. And it's got to be everybody on this podcast has been in conversations with people who are fully engaged versus in conversations with people who, whether they're looking at their phone or they're just not mentally there or whatever. And it's not only the quality of the conversation, but I, I think back to Dale Carnegie, you know, a hundred years ago, if you're fully engaged in that conversation, you're making a connection with that person and they will remember you. You may not say much at all, but they're going to think you're wonderful because you were just fully engaged sincerely in what was going on. Yeah. And, and right now, Dave, it's happening for people listening to this podcast. They're distracted. They might be commuting. They might be driving a car. They might be running. They might be doing chores, but it's happening for you right now. 
And the reason you're distracted is I speak at 125 words a minute. A horse race caller might speak at 200 words a minute, but we can listen at 400 words a minute. So we're genetically and neurologically programmed to be distracted. And the difference between a recreational listener and a deep listener isn't that they get distracted. Trust me, I get as distracted as anybody else. The difference is noticing you're distracted and then coming back into the conversation. The difference between me and a recreational listener, the gap between when I know I'm distracted and coming back into the conversation is much shorter. So I'm not perfect. I struggle with my listening. It's a daily practice. But for each of us, if we just left this conversation knowing the simple thing that I speak at 125 words a minute, you listen at 400 words. If we're programmed to be distracted, remove every other distraction that's going on. Remove the cell phone. Help your brain breathe. Help your brain be hydrated. And you will be set up to listen much better. Yeah, and it's it also I like the fact that you start with yourself because if we want other people to be deep listeners, we have to be a role model. Yeah, and, and when I know, talk on this topic, yeah. everybody comes to me after after I've spoken, and and these are the two questions I always get: Oscar, how do I teach my kids how to be better listeners? And Oscar, <laughs> I'm a good listener, but my boss, my coworker at work, they're terrible listeners. What have I got to teach them? And in both cases. By you role modeling good listening, you'll improve the listening of your child, your listening of the coworker. For those of you who are parents out there, the simplest thing you can do to listen to your child is get your eyes down to their eye level. So if you're taller than your, and your child, make sure you come down to their eye level or lift them up to your eye level because eye level to ear level means you can hear, but more importantly, you can see what they mean. That also applies if you're traveling. If you're traveling and you've got kids and you're FaceTiming with them, make sure your eyes are at the same level off the ground that they are. And that'll create a completely different listening connection for you compared to anybody else. If you're an adult and you're in the workplace, try and avoid sitting directly across the table from somebody. Maybe sit diagonally opposite them or maybe side by side. You'll be amazed how that will transform your listening experience as well. But you're right, Dave. It starts with you. If we want change in the world, it's always got to start with us. Now, now, you know, it's interesting what you just brought up about where you sit at the table, whether you're straight across from them or to the side. I remember that I learned visiting somebody who was going through a tough time that um, it, instead of focusing on sitting across from them, there were two techniques that I learned. One was to pull out a puzzle and work on the puzzle while the conversation went on because that removed the us versus them type of attitude. And mm -hmm. the other thing that came up was if you're a boss and you had something difficult to discuss with an employee, that it's much better to go for a walk where you're side by side versus sitting across the table and having that conversation where just the format of being across the table could come across subconsciously as being adversarial. Yeah. And a lot of these techniques are really beautifully done in the east whether that's japan or china or korea uh, these really high context cultures are deliberate about the room layout there you'll see more round tables than square tables as an example the walking meeting is a one that i would strongly recommend if you've got teenage boys and you want them to listen to you give them a task to do but be side by side with them much like that jigsaw puzzle that you talked about david um it, Give them a chore like chopping up food. Give them a chore, something in the garden, and you'll be surprised how the conversation goes when you're not face-to-face. -face. Um, teenage girls, quite the opposite. Sit down with them, have a meal face-to-face, -face, uh, usually sitting down as well. Um, men and women listen slightly differently, but statistically not m majorly differently. If I could give one tip to all the men out there, don't try and fix your wife. Don't try and listen to fix anything, just listen to feel. And if you listen to feel, that'll completely transform your relationship there. <laughs> That's the toughest thing for a guy. It's like, oh, problem, I'll solve it. Yeah, <laughs> I got it. I got the solution. Shall we have some fun with the other four levels? Yeah, yeah, let's go there. So level two is listening for the content. Level three is listening for the context. 
Level four is listening for what's unsaid. And level five is listening for the meaning. So, you know, particularly in the active listening movement, the focus is level two. Level two in the active listening movement is saying not only listen to what is said, notice the body language and the state of the person and keep keep constantly doing things. Like, mm -hmm, I understand. Tell me. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's level two. That's where in the 80s and the 90s, there's a very significant movement called the active listening movement. And it really helped to move forward the listening movement globally. And active listening is what is commonly taught in sales programs, in management consulting firms, in brief taking professions, in medical practices as well. Even in emergency surgeries, active listening is something that's taught. But as you can see, it's only one of five levels of listening. And I think for most of us, you will never be able to notice the change in somebody's breathing or body state if you're on a phone, if you're on a laptop. So if you can notice the speaker's breathing, then at level two, you can notice when their voice changes ever so slightly. So my vocal cords, I just change them ever so slightly in that last conversation when I said the words ever so slightly. So if you hit rewind on your podcast catcher, you'll hear my voice, I'll amplify it now. So my voice went a bit further down there than where I was before. But if you're on a phone and you're distracted, you probably won't even pay attention to that. So at level two, if you've really mastered this level and you need to be building from level one to level two, you'll start to notice the change in their breathing. You'll start to notice where their voice is coming from, not just what they say, not just what their body language is. And ultimately, I interviewed an amazing woman out of Florida. She's called the human lie detector, Susan Constantine. And she said, too many of us believe in the pop culture of body language. Arms crossed means the person's being defensive. Now, she teaches judges, police officers about lie detecting. And she can, she can say, hey, you know what? People with crossed arms might be sitting under an air conditioning duct and it's really cold. So don't assume that someone's got their arms crossed that they're going to be defensive. So it's all about congruency. So is what they say aligned to their body language? If they say they're excited, but their voice tone is down here, it's probably not congruent. Or if they say they're sad, but they're speaking in an upward inflection, they're probably not the same as well. That's level two. Um, for a lot of people in selling professions, that's basically the net sum of everything they've ever been taught about listening, Dave. Wow, so then, how do you shift the context and where does context play in? Yeah, so at level three, we're listening for patterns. We want to understand, does this person always speak in language that's about the past or the future? Do they speak about themselves or do they speak about others? Do they speak about problems or do they speak about solutions? So if we start to notice their language pattern, it will also help us to understand the context on which they're coming from in a conversation. So a really powerful question you can explore at level three, listening for the context, you can ask people that you're in a good relationship with, hey, I'm curious if you're noticing the same pattern in this conversation that I am. Now, your job is not to actually tell them what the pattern is. That defeats the purpose of the question. I can guarantee you when I ask this question, Dave, nine times out of 10, the pattern the speaker notices is completely different to the pattern I notice. And my job is to help put a mirror up to the speaker because you see the difference between an active listener and a deep listener. An active listener tries to make sense of the conversation for themselves. A deep listener helps the speaker make sense of their own conversation. And remember, we talked about 125, 400 rule. There's a bigger problem. The problem is this. I speak at 125 words a minute. But in my head, I've got 900 words a minute stuck in my thinking. So the likelihood that the first thing out of my mouth is what I'm actually meaning is a one in nine chance. I, Dave, I'm at the stage in my life that I spend too much time with a doctor. And if a doctor gave me an 11% chance of surgery survival, 
I'd say I need a second opinion. Yet at context, most of us don't ask the speaker for a second opinion. We just accept whatever they've said the first time is what they're thinking. And the reality is it's not. So notice the patterns. And in noticing the patterns, help them notice their patterns as well. And what they'll say is, hmm, yeah, I'm pretty stuck in the past, aren't I? Or they'll say, yeah, I'm making this much more complex than it needs to be. Or whatever pattern they come up with, that will help them make sense of what they're saying because they've always got other things stuck in their head. Another powerful question as we move to level four is to simply say, tell me more. Or what else are you thinking on this topic? The ninja move of listening is listening to what's unsaid because you're unpacking those 800 unspoken words. And when you ask them, tell me more, they'll do things like, well, actually, what I should tell you is, or they'll do that same deep sigh and say, what I haven't told you. Or they'll do that deep sigh and they go, you know what's really important that we haven't discussed? And all of a sudden we're starting to unpack those other 800 words in their head. And they think you're an amazing listener because you've just become comfortable with asking a simple question that's less than five words that says, tell me more. And that helps them unpack, unpack their thinking. When we can listen at this level, everything starts to change and your impact is eight times bigger because you're starting to explore those. Now, Dave, don't ask, tell me more eight times. It will only frustrate them. But let's get a little bit more comfortable with using silence. Let's be comfortable with listening to silence at its beginning, at its middle and at its end. Let's treat silence like it's another word. Again, in the West, we love to jump in. We use these terms like pregnant pause and awkward silence. Yet in the East, in China, Japan, Korea, as silence is a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of seniority. It's a sign of respect. And I think just becoming a little bit more comfortable with silence is ultimately where we want to get to. Well, I reminded when you talked about um, the patterns in level three, that um, we have done some work with Lorray Kui, um, a former FBI agent, and she used the term clustering. Hmm. So when they were working with somebody, they would look for, you know, not a one-off on yeah. a body language, microfacial expression, tone of voice, or, or something else. Yeah. They would try to cluster them to confirm, is this a one-off, or is this something that's really leading to a new perspective or the truth type of thing? Yeah. And whether it's um, Paulie, your FBI agent, or Susan, the um, human lie detector, all their work comes from the foundational work of Paul Ekman, um, who's done a lot of work yeah. on this and uh, uh, advisor to a number of TV series about this as well. Level five is listening for the meaning. It's the most potent part of deep listening. And I remember I was in a room talking to 83 people managers in a manufacturing site for a sterile manufacturing organization. It was about three years ago. And I was invited to talk about deep listening. But by the 30 minute mark, Dave, have you ever been in a room where you could cut the tension with a knife? No matter what you did from the stage, it was still tense. Yeah, yeah. This was that room. I turned to my host, who was the CEO, and I said, I'm going to change it up a bit if you're okay. And he said, do I have a choice? I said, yeah, you've got a choice. It's up to you. I simply said, do you trust me? And he goes, well, I guess I have to as he spat the words out. <laughs> and if, if, he, if he was a superhero villain, he'd have those X-ray eyes going straight into my head at this point in time. And I'd simply said to the room, hey, do me a favour. Turn to the person next to me and tell me, tell the other person what movie's going on at this location right now. And I turned back to my host who was sitting down. I stepped off the stage and he said, what the heck? We, we did not talk about that. I said, I'm sensing something completely different in the room. 
um, just bear with me for the next 90 seconds, the, the mood in the room changed. Everybody was laughing. Everybody was joking. There was lots of conversation going on. And I brought the room back, or at least I tried to, and, and kind of said, okay, let me hear these movies. What's going on here right now? And the movies were Die Hard and Titanic and Towering Inferno, and it was every disaster movie you could ever imagine, Dave. <laughs> and at that point the CEO came up, took the microphone off me and I thought, well, I guess I'm not getting paid for this. And I stepped off stage and he did something quite profound at that point. He said, thank you, Oscar. We've been struggling with something for three months and you've been able to put your finger on it in 30 minutes. He turned to the room and said, I'm sorry, I need your help. I don't feel good and nor should you about coming to work in a disaster movie. What can we do to change it? And with that, he handed over the microphone to me and said, Oscar, for the next 20 minutes, can you help us? And I simply asked this question to a room full of Six Sigma uh, chemical engineers and experts in sterile manufacturing process. I asked them the question, who haven't you listened to to solve this problem? Because you see, Dave, the backstory is there was uh, $3 million worth of stock held up in quality assurance because they hadn't been able to solve a problem in a pipe. And the consensus from the room was we haven't been talking to the frontline workers, the production line employees. They went after this spoke to the production line employees and solved the problem in three days. They've been working on it with very sophisticated stuff for three months. They'd called in external consultants. They'd had all sorts of machines, x-raying pipes, and it was the production line employees, people they weren't listening to, who solved a $3 million problem in three days where they'd been mucking around for three months. Now, the reason I tell that story is not because I'm any awesome rock star when it comes to listening. It's I gave the room permission to tell the truth by simply saying, what movie are we doing? You see, for those three months, everybody feared telling the CEO the truth and the CEO wished everybody would tell him the truth. And when you make an impact beyond words and you listen at that level, it wasn't listening to the movies. It was listening to the mood in the room and listening to the tension and ultimately helping these people help them listen to their production line workers. They were able to solve the problem very quickly. Now, for all of us, we have ex stories exactly like that because we're not listening to the people who are closest to the customer, the people who are closest to the process. Those people know the solution much better than most managers, most leaders and most executives most of the time but we choose to ignore them. And that's the cost we pay when we don't listen to the people who are closest to the action. So when we listen to the meaning, whether it's $3 million released from quality assurance or, or big banks that make decisions where they're not listening to their risk departments, or whether it's Facebook not listening to governments at the moment, or all these things are all the big costs of not listening. So they're the five levels of listening, Dave. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, two thoughts come to me with that because my mind's moving, right, at mm. 900 words a minute or whatever. But um, one, I was reminded that of the Wells Fargo uh, situation here in the States where they incentivize their sales team to basically cross-sell, mm. to sign up somebody for one account, but they get them to open multiple other accounts, and they started doing it without the client's permission. Mm because they'd get their, they'd get their bonuses. Yep. And I have to suspect that early on, there were people on the front lines, like what you say, who knew there was a problem. Mm. But the people much higher up didn't want to hear about it or weren't talking with them. Yep. And so they paid no attention. And so it mushroomed into a, a huge, huge disaster mm. that tarnished a very highly respected company for yeah. a long time. And probably costs a lot of jobs. Yes, yes. And then I'm struck also by your story in that your CEO, who seemed very defensive, very protective in his interactions with you initially, um, you were brilliant in your questions that you asked. But the fact that he actually mm. chose a different route 
He yeah. chose to step down, to be humble, to apologize, to ask for help. Yeah. And without that open door and the willingness to listen, which you had been talking about, I'm, I'm sure, hmm. you know, they, they wouldn't have gotten to the front line. At least yeah. not at that time. Yeah, and it was that very moment where he said, I'm sorry, that really created a connection with the broom to go, yeah. he's not perfect. We can help him and help us and help our patients who ultimately use what they were manufacturing. And it, it's no surprise that started to create a climate where issues that have been lingering along for a long time were spoken up about and yeah. great great leaders who show that kind of humility reap amazing benefits now i'm curious you you've got the book you know so so the book for nobody most people listen but it's a small book there's also a bunch of cards will you please describe why you chose the small book format and then why you give the cards and if somebody really wanted to go for this, really wanted to learn it, mm. about how long will it take for them to feel like they've made some progress and then really start to develop some expertise as a deep listener? So I, I had an arm wrestle with my book editor um, around the format. I said, Kelly, I don't want a book that's a dust collecting trophy on somebody's shelf. This book is going to be read, it's going to be used, and it's going to be held closely by people. And what's funny, Dave, I get all sorts of amazing photos from people around the world in coffee shops on riverside banks. I even had somebody send me a photo from their hotel room as they were having a bath. Thankfully, they didn't show me a photo of them, but with the book in there. <laughs> The book is meant to be read in under two hours. It's very dense. It, its size belies itself. Um, there's a lot of very complex topics in there, but I, want, I wanted it to be very accessible. The other thing we've done, and you may or may not have noticed this, Dave, there are blank pages to help people think and pause rather than continue to listen that are placed very strategically in the book to help them think about the concept that they've just read previously there's some whimsical characters in there um, the, to kind of bring the concepts to life that we're going to make a little animated um, comic strip with as well but the playing cards are designed for adults to become playful with an abstract topic we also have a series of deep listening jigsaw puzzles it was interesting you mentioned a jigsaw puzzle earlier on Dave but we also have um the four villains of a listening jigsaw puzzle game, which we play with everybody from investment bankers uh, trying to close big deals to nurses in aged care homes and everything in between. You see adults learn better when their hands are on something. And uh, you probably even notice with the cards, there's an interesting little tactile feel that we've put into the cards that gives it a little ridge. It's not like your normal deck of playing cards from Las Vegas as well. Many people comment on that. This book and the playing cards and the jigsaw puzzle all been designed within an inch of their life. We've had adult learning theorists to help us on this journey. And the next part of that journey is to develop a deep listening mobile app and a deep listening uh, audio coach. So imagine you say to Siri, hey Siri, record my next conversation, opt in everybody who, uh, opt out everyone who doesn't provide privacy permission. And then Siri rings you at the end of the meeting and says, hey Oscar, I noticed there's a gap in your calendar. Um, there were eight people at the meeting, but only three people spoke. So next time, um, it would be great to hear from all opinions in the room. Uh, you asked two why questions, which sounded very judgmental, and Siri replays them to you. And then Siri says, hey, your next team meeting's in a month. I'll call you the day before to reinforce these points. So we're working with a market research company at the moment around the design for that. The technology for that already exists, just a little bit expensive, but that's how we'll move to 100 million deep listeners. And Dave, to you, I'll ask question about how do we make progress on the path to deep listening? What does it take? It takes daily deliberate activity. And anybody who's 
run a marathon or does yoga knows that everything's just a practice. So all I would ask you to do is for the next week, switch your phone into flight mode for every conversation that matters. And every conversation that matters is every conversation. And if all you did was switch off your phone or switch it into flight mode, you would notice things completely differently. If you want practical steps, if you visit listeningmyths.com, you can download the five myths of listening and it gives you five practical things to do each week. Uh, Kevin in Atlanta challenged me to build a deep listening 90 day challenge. And he's the guy who said we should be doing a billion listeners, Dave. And uh, we're working with him to create a, a 13 week 90 day challenge to make everybody a better listener as well. So hopefully in all of that, people can do that. There's also the Deep Apple award-winning Deep Listening podcast series where we interview professional listeners like air traffic controllers, FBI hostage negotiators, judges in, in Supreme Courts, doctors in emergency surgeries about how they listen. But we also interview palliative care nurses. How do you listen when people are on their dying breaths? And journalists, how do they listen? And all of these people provide three practical tips about how you can improve your listening as well. well I, I think that's awesome. I think, and once again, what you said was uh, listeningmyths.com? Listening myths, M-Y-T-H-S, yes. Okay, and that way people can know how to get a hold of you. They can learn more about the book. Um, you know, I certainly recommend it. And I love the fact that everybody can leave today with something to do. And I would actually tack on not only just the flight mode on the phone, but you mentioned the hydration and the deep breathing. And you actually had a you actually had a statement here in the book that I saw that you said um, modern neuroscience reinforces the importance of breathing on the brain's ability to allow the mind to relax, expand, and listen. And you went on from there. And so I think those yeah. those three Science things pretty simple. easy for people to try. Yeah, the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. It's not that hard, but most of us don't even notice how we're breathing because we're stuck in our head with the last meeting, the next meeting, or something else that's uh, keeping our attention. <laughs> <laughs>